Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 203, Thematic Depth, Avoiding Pasted-On Themes in Board Games. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me live tonight, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. Remember that we record live Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and you should come join us in our chat room, the lobby. So tonight we're going to be talking about board game themes, reviewing a game themed on Belgian beers, as well as talking about the games we've been playing lately, including some first ever plays. During all of our shows, we mention a lot of stuff. Games, Mm -hmm. podcasts, Kickstarter publishers, past articles, old podcast episodes, and more. Find links to these things in our show notes, which you can find at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 203 once this episode is live. With that, let's get started over in the suggestion box. Welcome to the wondrous box of suggestions. Here we share a small selection of feedback we've gotten on our content. Up first, a comment from Tori Brown on our grade school gaming event topic back in episode 146. Oh goodness, this is so thoughtful and extensive. Thank you. It also makes me curious if you, Ho Rutila, ever followed up with how that game event went. Do people tell you if they took your advice or recommendation? Well, thanks for the comment, Tori. Um, no, I never did hear back on you, Ho, on this particular topic, though I will admit um, I didn't get to it on the podcast until well after he asked the question. I did respond back and forth in email and give him suggestions before we recorded the full episode, but I never did actually hear how it went. And to be honest, that's kind of the the usual. Unfortunately, it's kind of rare when we do actually hear back from people after answering their questions. Now, I've always taken the the feeling that no news is good news approach to this, assuming that it must have worked. We haven't heard complaints and we haven't heard good things. And we just assume people are off now happily gaming with their new games or having done their session zero. Now and then, though, we do hear back. And that is always awesome. Um, For a great example, check out our feedback section of episode 200. If you go to the um, suggestion box there, we've got a really extensive one where we got a lot of feedback on a particular topic. All that said, uh, if we have answered your question, we would love to hear how we did. Up next, a comment on our very popular topic of Super's RPG Sean has read. This time, a positive take from Stephen Pike. I, for one, appreciate hearing about new games. Many of these I haven't heard of, and it's a nice change from the usual Mutants and Masterminds, Champions, and Phase Rip suggestions that you hear about all day. In particular, Save the Day sounds fun. Just a minor note, though, being Canadian is in itself a superpower and includes a 50% resistance to cold. Well, it's nice to hear some positive response to this topic for a change. (laughs) And introducing people to RPGs I'd read, to other RPGs I'd read, was really the whole point of that topic. Not to show any particular favoritism or cast any shade on any products. Now, sticking with the positive, here's a nice one from Darian Original, who commented on one of Mo's recent unboxing live streams to say, Hi, found your podcast a couple of months ago while hiking. Just Mm want to say, thanks for the effort you put in these. Even though I have many episodes still to go, the ones I watched rekindled my love for board games again. Thanks once more. Well, hiking. Interesting. Well, thanks, Darian. Um, That's some awesome feedback right there. And thanks for stopping in on the live stream just to drop me that comment. That was just a cool moment in the middle of unboxing to have someone show up and go, hey, found your podcast. We love it. And I'm like, oh, sweet. Brighten my day. Thank you. And the fact that people can listen to us while hiking means that it actually is, as far as I'm concerned, a great podcast. You know, you don't need to be sitting down and watching us. You can really listen uh, if you're out on a hike. Now, next, I've got a comment from Peter Schott on our Dice Kingdoms of Valeria coverage. Peter says, this is definitely a winner at our house. We missed the complete citizens in order rule, but got most of the rest. We use pencils for the reasons noted about markers, but a different color for stars is a good idea. Mm -hmm. We haven't tried at five. I was concerned that might lead to an unintentionally shorter game. If that works, we'll give it a try, though. The game gets enough playtime that I ended up ordering a new set of the summer sheets already. <laughs> I don't usually consider laminating uh, roll and write games because they don't get enough play, but this one might be the exception. 
Hey, Peter, glad to hear you're digging Dice Kingdoms as much as we are. I gotta say, it's fascinating to me that different people have gotten different things wrong about this game. It's not that complicated a game, but there are enough little tiny bits that different groups miss. Uh, for example, we were doing it so that we used all the dice every turn. We had another comment where they had every player picking dice to use every turn. So one player would roll everything, everyone would harvest, then everyone would pick a die from that roll. And I, that sounds fascinating to me. I almost want to try the game all these different ways. Of course, then we'd be running out of sheets as well. I have to assume if everyone was using dice every turn, it'd be a quicker game. But I also mean, to me, would think everyone's board would be similar at the end because you're using the same numbers that the first player rolled every time. But anyway, it just fascinates me that everyone's different. Yep. And about the five player part, we really can't recommend that anymore. While it works, yeah. it's different enough, not to mention the fact that it's eating up those sheets that you're already reordering. And to get back to the question, it makes for a longer game, not shorter. Does not speed things up adding another player. Now, it wouldn't be a bellhop's feedback section without something from Chris Groff. This was in regards to our top 25 of all time list. Now, I think my gaming tastes run closer to Sean's based on your top 25s, but we are all in agreement that Duke belongs on that list. <laughs> well, thanks as always for the comment and interactions, Chris. Uh, we, we might have to try to fit him in every week just to we'll make a segment, Chris Groff says. Uh, what we do need to do, though, is end up at the same con again. I was going to say, I'm sorry we missed you at, at a breakout, but you didn't end up going either for the same reason we weren't able to make it. But at some point, we're all in Canada. We're all fairly close together. We need to hook up and play something together. Though I don't know of a three or four player version of the Duke, but I'm sure we can find something on all our lists. Well, I think that's good enough for now. Remember, even if we don't read your comment out on the air, we'd greatly appreciate mm -hmm. any and all feedback and conversations that come out of your replies. I think it's time to remind everyone about that big thing we've been promoting for weeks, but is ending soon. There is only one week left in our big 200th episode giveaway. That's right. We launched it on the day our 200th episode dropped, and it's going to end on the day this episode drops. As we get into that final stretch, we ask if you would do us a favor and send out a final call to action for your friends, fellow gamers, and social media followers to jump in at the last minute. This not only helps us out, but it's a great way to thank our sponsors. Good luck. Now, hopefully, next week in this same segment, we'll be able to announce all of the winners, but it'll depend on if people get back to us. So if you did enter, be sure to start watching your email inbox, whatever email you use to sign up on Wednesday, because we're going to want to confirm all those entries before we announce the winners. Well, that's it for the announcements this week. It's time to answer one of your questions and let you ask the bellhop. <laughs> We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from Tabletop Bellhop Patreon patron, Danielle, better known as Majikela, in our lobby chat room on Twitch. Are there board games that pick a time in history or region for the aesthetic that are actually good? Well, thanks for the question, Danielle. Uh, now, I found this question to be a bit ambiguous, so I actually reached out to Danielle on our Discord, which you can join at discord.tabletopbellhop.com, to get some clarification. Now, what Danielle meant by this is that there are many games that pick a specific point in history or a region for their theme, but do this in a very casual manner and don't give that point, that, that, that region or point, time in history, the attention it truly deserves. Now, Danielle is a history major and sick of seeing games that do things like, for example, use feudal Japan because it looks cool and samurai are cool without actually trying to tie that theme to the game in any way except for the visual graphic aesthetic. Now, this goes for areas of the world, like in particular Japan, but also eras and specific moments in time as well. Uh, but it can also be expanded if you want to look at most theming from games, from time and place to uh, intellectual property uh, and genres. So what I want to talk about here tonight to kind of broaden and narrow the topic both at once is to talk about thematic depth in board games. How deep is the theme? We don't want a surface level theme. We want depth that actually gets down to the mechanics. Now, what we've seen publishers and designers do to avoid this problem uh, that they've done 
And we're going to look at some games that actually get this right, that have good thematic depth or deep theming, and games that totally miss the mark by just pasting on a theme. Does your favorite game about, insert topic here, actually have anything to do with yeah. that topic? Or did someone just wave a theme over a finished product? Uh, now, we're not the misdirected mark, and we don't have Todd Crapper yelling out Definition Panda, but I would like to start out by mentioning what we mean by theme here. And I think everyone probably gets that, but just in case, this is the subject matter of the game, what the game's built on, the setting, the fluff, the background, the story, the paragraph you read at the start of the rule book before you get into actually how to play. This also includes what the players there are doing during the game, where they're doing it, and why they're doing it, as well as any like potential progression that happens during the game. Now, a great example that goes both ways that most people can relate to, for better or worse, is <laughs> Monopoly. There are literally thousands of Monopoly games themed for every school, city, TV show, movie, game that you can think of. But how many of those are actually just New York finance with the names changed? How many are actually changed to represent this new theming? And I got to say, this is one that almost hits close to home because I, I no longer fall for it. But there was a while there where a new Monopoly be come out and I'd be like, oh, sweet. There's a Star Wars Episode One Monopoly back when we were all excited about Episode One because the Monopoly came out before the movie did and got it and was like, no, it's just Monopoly. Like, like, come on, like, give me light side. Give me dark side. Give me something that feels like Star Wars instead of just building hotels that are instead called something else. Now, one of the things that happens with games is that themes may or may not have to do with the mechanics at all, which this is where we get into that thematic depth in Danielle's question. What we want is to find games where the theme does tie to the mechanics, or perhaps the other way around, the mechanics tie to the theme. You want those two to integrate. That's how you get a deeper game. For example, what theme does chess have? Everyone knows what the theme is, but I've never seen a mounted guy on a horse move in an L-shaped position to move up to attack a plebe. It just uh, maybe in that one movie where everyone's on motorcycles with lances, that might have happened, but that's about it. Yeah, chess is interesting. And I there are uh, reasons and, and, and design mostly lost to history behind the types of movements of each uh, piece. But uh, what happens when you change the king to something else? Uh, in many cases, it may still work uh, from garden plants competing over the lawn to gods and goddesses battling. Uh, any sort of battle between two opposing foes often still makes sense. But mm -hmm. if you change it to, for instance, one I saw when I was looking around was two football teams. It suddenly makes a lot less sense. Sure, football is a battle of sorts, as Blood Bowl has proven to us, but an entirely different sort that is not at all well represented by chess. Unless maybe your game of sports ball chess is just one quarter black blitz. That's all it is. It's it's one blitz, but then you still wouldn't be going both ways. Yeah, you so wouldn't have a quarterback on both sides. Both so. <laughs> so, so that doesn't quite work. Yeah, no, totally true. Um, now, another thing that's interesting is, um, and this actually goes with something Roger just said in the chat, to him, mechanics should drive the theme and the art enhance it, not the other way around. And I disagree. I think it can go either way. Theme can come before or after mechanics. And you can totally come up with an awesome theme and find mechanics to fit for it. Or you can already have your mechanics and then try to think of a theme that fits those mechanics. And I've got to say, mainly theme driving mechanics is where you get the deep theme because you're starting with a theme you care about. Whereas if you've got some neat mechanics you came up with, maybe a nice neat dice pool system or a, a roll and move that's actually fun, trying to find the game that fits that is probably going to end up with more of a pasted on style theme. Right. If you were able to paste a theme onto your mechanics, who's to say someone else isn't also? I think is, is a lot of what happens. You may have developed a fantastic abstract game, which can take themes like a coat of paint or wallpaper, uh, but that generally means it's not going to be deeply themed uh, right. because someone else is just going to wipe off that paint and put on a different set. 
which is actually what happens a lot. And I don't know if a lot of uh, casual gamers who just buy games and play them realize this, but a lot of games, by the time they get in your hands, have a completely different theme than the original designer intended. When you are marketing a game to publishers, one of the rights you are probably going to have to wave away if you want your game signed is you're going to have to give up your theme because that publisher is going to have an idea of the type of themes they want, what they want to sell, what the current trend is, etc. And they're going to retheme your game like that's part of what they do to go. Yeah, well, that's a really cool theme, but no one's going to buy that. Here's something that's exciting right now. Right. And to steal something, uh, nothing, nothing personal, Roger, but to steal something from the chat room game on spiders might not be in the public zeitgeist right now but if you swap that over to slimes in a dungeon maybe it does work and maybe that is what people want right now and that's where the publisher may decide to take your game even if you have developed this really awesome game that you as far as you're concerned is all about spiders now, another good example of this, just jumping back to our last episode, which you can check out, that's episode 202, we reviewed a card game, a trick-taking card game called Court. And as part of that, I was like, wait a minute, this seems like it's been rethemed because there, there was one card that said, um, I forget now, Workshop, I think, instead of, instead of Courtroom or, or, or Court. And I'm like, what's that from? And I've actually now heard back from the designer who read the review and said, oh, no, it was originally supposed to be a steampunk theme with engineers building their workshop, which actually makes the steampunk looking horse symbol and the butterfly for suits make a little bit more sense. Indeed. I, I hadn't heard that yet. And that does make a whole lot yes. more sense. Uh, I, and probably to me makes for a more interesting game. I, I agree. I think that theme is better. So we, we've already mentioned this many times, but in general, what people call a, a game where the theme and mechanics aren't integrated especially not integrated at all, we tend to call those pasted on themes. Again, like Sean said, like wallpaper, you can always change the wallpaper. You can change the theme and it has no effect on the actual gameplay. And to me, that's what you're not looking for when you want a deeply thematic game. And this is even more important when you're talking about themes that are precise, which gets back to the actual topic here, not just generalizing. When you are talking about a specific time period or a specific place, you need that theme to matter. It has to be integrated with the mechanics. You don't want to paste it on theme. You want that to matter or else why set the game there? Right. If you're setting a game in feudal Japan, but if you step back and it could just as easily be armies charging across the fields in Breton, what's the point? Why, why have you gone with the feudal Japanese theme? Is it just because you think Asian culture is cool? And if so, stop. Yes. Think about what you're doing and think about what that says. So, of course, the opposite end are games with good thematic depth, where you're integrating the theme to the mechanics. And the key here is, would the game work without the theme? Is there anything there? Like, yes, mechanically, the game will work. But, like, does it make sense? Would you, would you still understand it? Or can you easily swap this theme to something else? Right. And what you want, the, the more depth you have, the harder this is. And I'm not saying it's impossible. Any game can be rethemed to anything else. But there are ways, which we'll get into some of them, how to make it stick, how, how to make that hard to do and make it so. And, th and the whole point here is something we've talked about on the show quite a bit recently is immersion. You want that theme to matter. Right. And especially if you're doing a narrow focused theme where you want someone to, I don't know if you want to feel like you're there, but like, yeah, you want to feel like you're hitchhiking around Belgium. Or you want to feel the plight of the refugees when the French are coming in. Like, that's what you're aiming for with these type of games. Now, one thing I will caveat, and we should have started with this. We are not saying deep-themed games are better than not deep-themed games. They're just two different choices. What we're looking for is deep thematic games. Where that theme matters is what Danielle's looking for. But I'm not necessarily saying your game has to have a deep theme. Some of our favorite games are highly abstract, like the Duke and Garinto. Absolutely. You don't have to theme a game, but if you are going to theme a game, think about the depth yes. and, and, and keep that in mind uh, there. You know, if your game can, if you can strip it all off and you can have, turn your game into Jenga, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't need necessarily need a theme or the theme isn't integrated well enough. 
uh, and you should rethink things, uh, perhaps. Or mm -hmm. maybe you're just better off having the next Jenga. Uh, yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to have a theme. So I will just throw out there: if you do give your game a silly game, a name, a silly game like Jenga, Google the name first, just to to kind of hint at a game that had actually really interesting theming that again had nothing to do with the game but then they threw another word in there that meant something totally different than the theme no matter what you're doing if you're a game designer please google google lots yeah, just google, google different spellings <laughs> find check your game yes. name <laughs> and make sure that when some random person says that name that someone else will be able to spell it yes just by hearing we it. We, we have talked about that and <laughs> It, uh, your game should be should be spellable but again we're, we're drifting we're a bit drifting. so i'm gonna i'm gonna use the chat room to get us back on topic here so uh and she games our awesome moderator said i saw someone on board game Re geek referring to the opposite of pasted on as heavily bolted which amused me which is interesting kind of gets the, the frankenstein theme there or you know riveted on theme you know, they're hard to separate yeah. which i think fits. Locked, locked in place makes a lot of sense locked in place they said to me deeply thematic means more sense to me um, Ryan's pointing out, given the time from design to table, it seems difficult to land a game in the market when the theme is topic is hot or not. You would not, you would be surprised how short the board game cycle is once the game signed from the publisher to the people. That's often under a year. It's that lead up. It's the play testing. It's the development. And honestly, one of the last things they'll do is put the theme on, on most of those games. So those games where the publisher is retheming it, that theme might have happened a week before in a boardroom before you know, they decided to actually start shipping the game. So not all, like, yeah, some games take 10 years to develop, but some themes don't. Yeah. Uh, I, I would recommend against, you know, starting building your newest uh, hot girls at the mall game right now. It's probably not the best timing. Uh, Unless you're in Windsor. Uh, yeah, I suppose. Um, Windsor does. I don't know what's up with our mall. Mall so. Still, It's one of the few in North America that seems to be. Yes. Uh, we, we... Uh, so, so Roger calls a Preda Porter. That's actually a good one. They considered retheming it, but didn't happen. But that's got some stuff to it. But in um, the the big thing right now is you are we are looking at good thematic depth. What we're doing is is you're you're bolted on as as we just said. It's it's they're well tied together, right? Uh, and there's a lot of games that where it where it doesn't really work. Uh, one of the things I found, noticed as, as I was sitting down thinking about this entire topic was I actually can't say I have really played that many deeply mm -hmm. thematic games a lot of the other games that i tend to have been attracted to or, or focused on um aren't uh they're either a pasted on theme or abstract um and uh you know one of the one of the most deeply thematic games themed games i can think of is in fact blood bowl which i referenced earlier yeah. um it's hard to separate that one away from its uh it's no, that's a good one it's actually sports games in general are probably a good one but like you're right we we were sitting here even just like we could have taken this topic instead of having a discussion about it done. Here's our top 10 deeply thematic games, which I also thought could be a follow up for next week. But I can't think of 10 deeply thematic games I've played. I, it's actually fairly rare uh, that the games aren't just like totally pasted on or, or fairly thin, right? Like loosely screwed on themes <laughs> seem, seem to be fairly common where, yes, there's some things that tie the theme to the mechanics, but really deep ones are definitely hard to find. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the ones I've called out a number of times uh, is uh, Lords of Waterdeep. Um, you know, it's a fantastic game. It's a great game. But I just sort of feel like it's a Euro and, and someone painted on the D&D &D, uh, graphics and, and text. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, another thing that you do have to talk about when we're talking about themes, especially once you're narrowing down, if you're talking about a specific time period, a specific place, or a specific group of people is handling that theme in a culturally appropriate way. Yes, for years, people designed games, went, yeah, that theme sounds cool, and they just published it. And people used to write books that way and do movies that way, and we are, we're smarter now. We, we've learned from our mistakes. We see the problem with that, and it's no longer appropriate to set your game in Asia because you think it's cool. That's Orientalism, which yeah. we now realize is a problem. People are... are but the internet has allowed us to connect with each other in ways where we were able to find out that we were doing things that were offensive that we didn't realize were. And nowadays it's up to you to make that change and stop doing so. And sadly, this happens far too often. Uh, many game designers, uh, if not most, are well-educated people. 
And this almost makes the problem worse, as they see certain types of research as the solution to all problems. However, research in many cases displays the reinforcing of cultural biases that have been passed down through the mm -hmm. white <laughs> nation, you know, the, 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 the cultural appropriation um, and into that available literature. Uh, and this is what you're avoiding by working with people of that culture yes. who are aware of the biases and able to direct you around such pitfalls when theming a game. So, yeah, when picking a theme for your game or when looking at a game to look at its theme and the depth of it, you need to consider this. Look, look at the is it being done culturally appropriately? And then when you were on to see how deep it is, you're looking at how well that theme is actually tied to the mechanics. And I think the big thing here is the games that do it right are games that have a mechanic in there to make the game thematic. That, that literally is only there because you're talking about that theme. And that's where you're getting it right. That's where you're getting it get to work. On the other hand, there's games that miss the mark. And we've already talked about a few but I want to call out a couple games in particular that, that to me totally missed the mark, even though I've heard people call them thematic. Now, this one, I excuse me, this one I haven't actually heard. But Danielle mentioned, mentioned Feudal Japan. And immediately when she mentioned Feudal Japan, sorry, they mentioned the Feudal Japan, an egregious example of this that we reviewed in the past, a game we enjoy. So, again, we're not saying the game gameplay is bad because of this is Gunkimono or Gunkimono. This game has a Japanese theme because people think Japanese is cool and samurai look neat. It has zip to do with the domino based gameplay of the game. You are stacking dominoes and scoring points for area control, which has absolutely nothing, nothing like, like not even a little bit tied to that theme whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another one that uh, that I came across and I haven't actually played this, but I was researching this because, again, I haven't run into a, a lot of this issue before, but I love Sky. Um, it was described as Scottish Carcassonne with an auction thrown in. Uh, and and it, it has nothing to do with the deep and rich uh, nature of the hand history of Scotland. Yeah. Uh, they're just using, oh, Scotland is cool. Yeah, well, they, they did on some of the tiles, if I remember, there are breweries or there's whiskey <laughs> barrels. I th I th I'm pretty sure that that's the, the only extent to the Scottish theme. And I think they call the coins whatever coinage they use in Scotland. But yes, I, I totally agree. Uh, Isle of Sky, definitely. Great game. You haven't played it. We should play it. To me, that's the cart killer. I love Scott, Isle of Sky over... over um, I thought we had Land and Sea. How many cart how many cart killers are we going to have here? I don't know. Lots because <laughs> it's old and crusty and no one plays anymore. No, no offense, cart fans. I still actually like cart because I find it... You need to play with cutthroat people, though. I don't like playing cart with friendly people. are like, oh, I'll help you finish this. No, I want to cut people off and make the big city. So, yes, that, that is one. Now, another one um, that I thought of and um, more Deanna brought up. So, like Danielle mentioned, they're, they're uh, a history major. Well, my wife is a classics major, and she hates when games totally just ignore Roman history, Roman or Greek history. And the absolute worst has got to be Rise of Augustus. We call this game Roman Bingo because that's what it is. You are... Drafting tiles that have symbols on them of, you know, um, charioteers and laurels and, and legions. And someone is pulling chips from a bag and going legionnaire and everyone covers over their legionnaires. And then once your card's full, you get to score it like it, it it's bingo. There, there is a little strategy there on what cards you draft to make it a little better than bingo. And honestly, it's a fun game. It's a good gateway. Sorry. What was it a welcoming game? It's a good one for new players. But what does that have to do with anything Roman? Did Are Romans known for their bingos? Did, did I miss that? Yeah, no. And now next year, I'm going to call out one of our favorite games, a game we love from a publisher we work with and we do adore. But uh, Garinto is a game that is an abstract game that someone decided to paste the Japanese Buddhist theme onto. It wasn't originally that. It was originally a different uh, theme completely um and they were pitched uh, an idea and, and they and they they went a certain direction and that fell through and then there's there's been designer diaries and this it's been mm. talked to death i don't want to overgo on uh, on the uh the issue because i know uh mark i'm sure is sick of hear, hearing people talk about Corinto. but the fact of the matter is while it is a fantastic game it is 
somewhat appropriating Japanese yep. culture and Buddhist culture. Yep. Now, another one Deanna pointed out, and this was the funny one, is Attica. So this was interesting. She's like, well, the first time she played it when she was playing, she's like, yo, no, it's it's tied to its theme, right? Like you are building various things that the Romans built, and a big part of it is building your roads and connecting these things. And it has to do with ho hooking up the temples of the gods. One way to win is to make a complete route between the temples of the gods. And then you get bonus amphoras, which were a sign of wealth to take bonus action. Sounds really thematic, right? Well, another publisher bought the rights to it and rethemed the game to be the U.S. telegraph system. <laughs> Successfully rethemed. It's, it's the exact same game. Uh, interestingly, uh, Ryan calls out in the chat room, Clans of Caldonia. And while on its surface, again, when you look at it, it feels like a pretty Scottish game. But when you strip it right down, you know, I, I, you change it from from beer to, uh, you know, some other <laughs> something else. And, and, and you change it from locks to, uh, to to lakes. There's not really anything other than the painted on level of theme on a really I, fun, enjoyable uh, Scottish game, but it doesn't address any of the, the history and depth of the Scottish people. It treats them all like farmers and sheep herders. So yeah, well, yeah, okay. So they're not, I personally disagree on this one. I think it's a highly thematic game because they put in actual Scottish clans. They did the history on the Scottish clans and found out what they're good at, gave them mechanics in the game to make those clans good at those things. They took the things that, that, that the Scottish people did farm and the things they're well known for and made a game around it. And no, you can't just watch the theme. You would have to redesign parts of that game to work with a different theme. If you wanted to do Greek, you'd have to look at famous Greek families and what they do. You couldn't be, well, well, this is the fishing family. This is the one that gets double for shipping. And this is the one that instead, um, I don't remember what all the different clans do in that game. I, I personally think that one's got a pretty deep theme. Maybe not the deepest. And maybe they didn't quite dive deep enough, but I think Clans of Caledonia actually did a really good job of making it unique to the Scottish. I mean, Island. I think I think in, in in some ways you're right, but at the same time, uh, again, there are I'm sure there are Greek families that fished, and I'm sure there are Greek families that made. But again, you have to redesign those. But but it, again, it's just that's just a little bit of research on what family did what. That doesn't speak to anything inherently Scottish. I think is is the is the thing. It's it's just the name of a clan. I uh, see. I, I still disagree. I think if you try to dig even deeper, you're trying to make a historical game about Scotland, which is a totally different topic. If you're trying to make a historical educational game. You're taking it a step further. Then you're getting into games like Freedom the Underground Railroad, which is a great example of a thematic game with mechanics tied to to um to the actual theme. And like I can't even mention the name of some of the the cubes in that game because <laughs> it would be seen as offensive, and the game right. handles it appropriately. I, they, I, I don't want to say there can be too much depth, but I think for a board game trying to just have a theme and make it a fun game without trying to teach history, I think Clans of Caledonia kind of nails it. And, and again, that's fine. But again, what, we're, what we've said all along is you don't need to have a deep theme uh, right. to me a fun game. I, we all love Clans of Caledonia. Everyone here is a fan, a fan of the game Clans of Caledon Caledonia. Uh, I'm just not sure that I couldn't over a weekend spin it into a different... Uh, a different uh, nature if I wanted to. All right, that one's on the fence then. So let's let's go to the other side of the fence and try to find some games that we think actually did get it right. Um, the reason we're reviewing the Belgian beer race tonight as part of this podcast episode is because I think it fits this theme. It, 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 I find it fairly deeply thematic. Uh, this is a game that only works because people travel, travel to Belgium and backpack and try to hit the breweries and collect glassware and collect coasters. Um, all the breweries in the game are real and what actions you can take at each brewery is actually based on actual places. Like there's a brewery where you can't do a tasting. You can't take anything to go because yes, you can't. All you can do is go and visit and watch them brew beer because they only sell their beer to select people. Um, the length of the bus routes is based on real things. And just the whole feel of the game going on a trip with a bunch of friends in Belgium. Like, yes, you could retheme the game again. You could, uh, we're going to mention a review. You could do the, 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 the German Pilsner beer tour, but you would have to change so much about the game that it would be a totally separate game. It wouldn't just be Monopoly with a different theme. Uh, one I think is an interesting one. And I, I, I'm tempted to say this is, is deeply themed, but it's, it's hard to say, but uh, the 1824 election game, I, I'm trying to remember, I'm blanking on the name of it now. Um, we've just recently reviewed 
uh revolution of yeah re- uh was it revolution not 18 no that doesn't sound right at all that's eight. um Stefan Feld on yes. a blank on, on the uh, year. I'm Revolution of 1828. Yes, Revolution of 1828. I this is a simple game, but in it it uses such a complex system of, of voting and moving with the parties and making use of the media that while yes, you could probably retheme it as something else, it would take a good chunk of work to make this bizarre set of mechanics they've put together um, work in, a, in something else. Whereas, you know, it, it fits into this really interesting and unique election uh, in the U S history quite well. I disagree on that one too, but that's yeah. all right. That that one to me is a pure abstract. They paste it on a theme and while well, Stefan Feld originally wrote it with a different theme completely. So that was the publisher tossing on a theme because of the popularity of a game I do think is highly thematic, and that's Twilight Struggle. So this is a game where you are trying to influence different areas of the world, and it's the U.S. versus the Soviets during the Cold War. And there are a couple mechanics in that that only work for that. For one, the DEF contract. Like, during that game, it is a competitive game, but if you both mess up enough, the world ends because of World War III. And that is a DEF contract. And the other is the tug of war for victory points in that game which is represented well in a couple other games, which even that um, the 1828, where as you get influence, you move along a victory point track. And it's not you gain points and your opponent gains points, but you actually pull a point thing back and forth. And at the end of the game, depending on where on the scale that is, it determines who wins, which I think very does a very good job of abstractly representing the Cold War. Fair enough. Now, one of the best uh, goes back to our topic of immersion is nyctophobia. Like, I don't know how you could more deeply, I, I guess if the theme was blindness, it would fit better. But like being scared in the dark, not knowing what's around you and having to feel around, that is totally immersed in nyctophobia. This is a game where you literally wear blindfold, blackout glasses, all but one player. Uh, the characters are trying to fumble around find each other and then get back to the car before they're murdered. And then the murderer is the person who can see where they all are. And, and like, I don't think you can do a better last girl type of movie or final girl. I said that style. I don't think you could do a better version of that. Fair enough. And I think going along with that, another deeply uh, theme one to me would be shadows in the forest, which we've talked about a bit recently with, with the, the light that moves around the board and, you're the you're trying to hide in the shadows created by 3D uh, yes. pieces on the board. A game about shadows that uses shadows. <laughs> that like, actually it, uses it, you, you can't shadows. really get anybody. I can't disagree with that one whatsoever. Yeah. So then Jeff Seuss was pointing out saying when Roger said mechanics should drive the theme and, and art enhance it, not the other way around, he was right. He's saying that you still target a theme first, but the mechanics should be what you're focused on when targeting the theme. The art, as in the graphics, should be what comes last. Yes, art is different. Art and theme are two, the, the art can match the theme and may not. That's, that's a totally different topic. Same with graphic design. I think you can totally start with the theme and then go the other way. I've done it when I've written games myself, RPGs. I came up with the theme of I wanted to play um, the Littles. I wanted the Borrowers. I wanted Rats and Nim. I wanted, I wanted little, little heroes dealing with big problems. From that, I decided the best way to do this would make a game where the smallest dice was better. The smaller the die was better. So I came up with a theme, and then I thought of a mechanic that tied to that theme. The entire goal of that game is to shrink your dice to nothing. You start off with a difficulty die that's big, and you do things in it to work the dice down smaller and smaller, because in that game, every mechanic I put in it, smaller is better. In all cases, smaller is better. So there's a perfect example of a game. You can download it right now. It's called the Diminutive RPG, because I didn't come up with a cooler name than that when I wrote it over at rpggeek.com. It's over there for free if anyone wants to grab it. It's a game I keep meaning to play test and go further with, but I never find time to. I, I think it can go either way. Uh, fair enough. Uh, now, we were talking you... about um, specific games that do it well, but I think war games in general do a better job of this than Euros in, in your average game because they are based on a specific period and time period and what they do to make them unique, like they might use all the same system, right? So we're going to take Hammer of the Scots, which is is 
Braveheart the board game, except based on the historical facts and not necessarily where the movie went, where where you've got the, the British against the Scottish and the wars that ensued. And it's a cube block game. So it's from Columbia Games and it's a cube system game. Well, Columbia puts out a bunch of those. A uh, second very thematic one from that is is Julius Caesar. The basic mechanics are the same. You put blocks out when they battle, you roll on the combat table, you rotate the dice, but then they throw in specific rules for that setting. Things like on turn three, William Wallace comes out. And when this happens, this happens. All of those parts of the game is what adds the depth to it. So the basic system of cube battles is, is just a mechanic. It can have any theme. And then you could just paste a theme on that and play, which is what um, Wizard Kings does. Because that lets you play any fantasy race, and they even did blind boosters for it to show just how randomly you could set things up and you randomly generate maps. Or you can take that and just by tying in even one mechanic, even one thing which could be the game end could make the game more deeply thematic. Even if like the game ends when this happens because historically that happened, you've already tied that theme in more. But then you throw in at the start of the game, this happens. And halfway through the game, here's one from Julius Caesar, Cleopatra can swap sides in that game. So that's something based on historical thing, and no other cube game has a unit that can swap sides. And and that's really a lot of, of what you need to think about when you're looking at whether a game is deeply thematic or not. Is there something in the rules specific to that theme? Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you know, if you're going the samurai route, is there something in the rules that represents something? honestly from the samurai other than you know just samurais look cool or ninjas are ninjas are sneaky or or something something else orientalist um yes. you know is, have you found that connection between the theme the feel and the actual play mm -hmm. of the game and then roger brings up a fantastic example of modern war gaming so for years war games were one to four players per side battling out the side that won wins the game with various victory conditions, but then came along the coin games, the counterinsurgency games where someone sat back and went, yeah, but the thing is, these people who are going to war each have their own different objectives, which not necessarily is wipe out the other unit or just take that bunker. There's a lot more going on behind the scenes, and that's what the coin games are about. Now, I've only played one of these myself, Fire in the Sky, which was about the Vietnam War. But America's goal in the Vietnam War was very different than North Vietnam's goal in the Vietnam War, which couldn't be represented by traditional hex and counter games. And the coin games do a fantastic job of doing that. But just to point out that theme can only go so deep, you have Root, which is a coin game about woodland animals battling in a forest. So <laughs> there is definitely that aspect of it. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to call out one more that I think was highly thematic because it needs more shout outs. I don't even know if you can get it, but the Red Bernoose Algeria 1857. This is a cooperative deck building war game that I found to feel very thematic that had me do more um, research into Algeria and the French occupation of Algeria because I didn't know enough about this time. It's the, the, the things in there, like the type of characters you hire. You are hiring like men and women to do things. And you are ar arming them the way the French army moves, what little defenses you have, how little time you have to organize. These are all mechanical elements that just reinforce the theme of that game and made you feel desperate, which was what was important. That was the message they were trying to get across. You wanted to feel desperate and feel like you had no chance. Yeah, and that's one of the, the big things, especially, you know, and everyone knows one of my favorite uh, game types are deck builders. And these can really span the whole the mm. whole range from from dc de uh, deck builder and as mo has said many many times it just doesn't feel right you no. you know you've got a batman card in front of you but you're grabbing wonder woman's lasso and and you know plastic man's ability to stretch it feels weird mm -hmm. uh or you got something like red bernus um or or even the the legendary games uh you know where you've got things that are building tension uh hellbringer with their tension, the the the, mm -hmm. the 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 time system that gives you that mounting tension that you know they're about to to come across the wall and crush you and you will lose. Um, there's a, a wide range uh, of. I think thematic, you meant Draconis invasion. Sorry, Draconis invasion. Yes, uh, a wide range of of things. Well, in Hellbringer, you've got a different thing where is if you're playing teams, 
so you you have different ranges of vision so some mm-hmm. people can see further into the into the mist and see monsters further away than you and you don't necessarily you aren't able to react to all the creatures yep. out there against you uh, yeah that was what hellbringer was trying to pull in the theme of a fog of war into a a roguelike deck building card well it wasn't deck building but card game yeah and that was their goal was to get that across and i think they did a good job on that aspect absolutely all right do we have anything else in the chat room before we move on because i think we kind of got our point across though we rambled a bit there talking about games that are thematic and not uh what i'll do while i give the chat one last chance to jump in is just to kind of summarize that you have games with pasted on themes where you can swap the theme out for anything else change the wallpaper game doesn't change and then you have somewhat thematic games where it's a little deeper and then heavily bolted on themes or deeply thematic games where the actual mechanics of the game are based on the theme and the other way around. That is, is what we're talking about here. And the main thing is, I think the, the final point I want to make is the more narrow your theme, the more you have to do this, the more depth your game needs. If you are looking at a specific region of Japan, give me a reason for it to matter. I'm in that specific region of Japan. If you are looking at a certain class of people like Algerians, um, give me a game where it matters that I'm now looking at that group of people. That's where I think it matters. And also be very careful, uh, hire cultural consultants, make sure you are handling the topic appropriately. One of the things to me that says whether or not you have managed to achieve a game with thematic depth is how I talk about it the next morning, the next day. Yeah. If I'm sitting around and saying, oh, I played this game about Germany last night, you would not believe it. As opposed to, oh, I played this board game last night. Uh, yeah, it was set in um, uh, Germany. And so we about this, this mechanic and this was really mechanic. Mm-hmm. If I'm talking about the mechanics and, and, and completely have forgotten what your theme is, yep. maybe you didn't quite get it as deep as you, you could have. All right, well, that's it for our talk on thematic board games something we would love to see more of what are some games you've played that you think get it right and have mechanics that make the theme actually important in the game tell us about it in the comments below now we're about to check in with our lobby here on twitch but before that a quick reminder we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions you can send questions to us by going to the website tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on Ask the Bellhop, send an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or send a message through social media where we can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Welcome to our review of The Belgian Beers Race, a game that feels like it may have been specifically designed for Mo. Thanks to Green Grand Gamers Guild for working with another local game uh, gamer to help get us a cop- review copy up from Gen Con. John had too long a coffee break or something. I don't know. Words words are hard. I should have brought some beer for this one. I should have beer up here for this review, but I do not. I actually, I, I can't say much because I don't actually have any Belgian beer in my house right now. This is too good. I can't, I can't let it sit. So the Belgians beer race, Belgians, I'm throwing extra S's in there. The Belgian beer race was designed by Mikhail Botro and features artwork from Ammo. Ammo is the official illustrator of the Cantillon and La Mule breweries in Brussels. This beer-themed board game plays two to four players, with games taking about half an hour per player, and I would say maybe a bit more than that. Uh, this game is listed for ages 14+, plus, but it does have a beer theme, which may mean limiting it to adults only. Though mechanically, this game's simple enough I could see even younger kids being able to play if you're not worried about that theme. The game was originally published by BYR Games, then brought to North America by Grand Gamers Guild, where you can get a copy of the game for $54.99 US. The copy of the game we received is the retail version of the game. There is also a deluxe Kickstarter edition that features upgraded components, but you won't find that in retail. Now, the Belgian Beers Race has players backpacking around Belgium and visiting its many breweries. Ride your bike, take the bus, or risk hitchhiking across the country to visit breweries, taste beers, buy beers and cheese, toast your friends, collect bottles and coasters, and accomplish objectives in this Euro Point salad. Just be sure to make it back to the Grand Palace in Brussels in time to catch your flight home and avoid huge point penalties. 
Now, for a look at each of the components in this beer-themed board game, check out our The Belgian Beers Race unboxing video on YouTube. So one thing you'll see right away that kind of struck me is the lack of any box insert, which just felt kind of odd. All the components are individually packaged, all the wooden one thing and all the cards shrink wrapped and everything, but everything was just kind of sliding around the box. Now that said, it didn't seem to be a problem. Nothing was actually damaged and the game does come with additional baggies, which makes it relatively easy to sort the stuff once you get it all split up and then organized. And this has been a real hit and miss topic these days and often a discussion uh, or decision of the original publisher that in this case would have been carried forwards by Grand Gamers Guild in order to avoid increasing the price point above what it could be in other regions and starting those strange little bidding wars on, e on eBay and places. <laughs> now, one thing we have mentioned multiple times on the show, really the box insert isn't there for you to use at the table. It's there to keep the game safe. And again, I will point out everything was in great shape, so it seems to have done its purpose, whether it was there or not. Now, what you do get in this game is a ton of wood. This is a wood heavy board game with beer bottles in four colors, which represent four different types of beers. You've got Trappist beers, browns, blondes and stouts cubes in the same colors representing backpacked beers, um, player components, including wooden trackers for visiting different breweries, scoring and time track markers, a cheese marker, another marker for your alcohol level marker for your toasting and tasted beer trackers, and a very cute little hiking meeple, which was actually a stretch goal that came out in all copies instead of your standard meeple. You also get punch boards with coaster tokens, visited brewery tokens, and 50-point bottle caps in single-layered player uh, board with a huge six-panel main board, three custom D6s that used when moving around the board, and a deck of various objective cards. Now, in addition to pretty clear rule book, you also get a rather thick beer guide with information on each of the breweries in the game. This in the center of it also includes a checklist and tasting sheet that you could theoretically take with you on an actual trip to Belgium. Now, one thing we did appreciate is that the publisher took the time to choose red, green, colorblind, friendly colors for these components. Mm -hmm. Well, now that you have an idea of what you will be getting, let's move on to an overview of play. So start a game of Belgian beers race by seeding the board with randomly drawn coaster tiles and place an appropriately colored beer bottle onto every brewery, including the ones that got coasters. The objective cards are sh sorted and shuffled. The level one objective deck is placed on the board face up and seven are drawn. Four of these will be available to be claimed, while four will show objectives that can be claimed later. The level two objectives are put to the side for now, and a set number of level three objectives, based on the player count, are drawn and placed on the board. These are the end game scoring opportunities. Now, players take a player board and all the wooden components in their color, as well as a piece of cheese. These are placed onto their player boards and main board as instructed in the rulebook. These are going to track all kinds of different things throughout the game, like your alcohol level, the number of beers you've tasted, and so on. Your hitchhiker meeple is placed on the board in the Grand Palace in Brussels. A game of the Belgian's beers race is played over three days and two nights and uses a time track system to organize play. At the start of the game, everyone begins in the Grand Palace and everyone must try to end their trip back there on day three. Every action in the game takes a set number of time units, and you only have so much time each day to accomplish things, with more time on the second day than the first and third, which represents getting into Brussels and having to catch your flight out. Now, the player who's furthest back on the time track is the active player that turn, and will continue to take actions until they become the first player on the track. Then the player now for this back on the track will take actions until they're first and so on. This is going to continue until you hit the end of the track for that day. Note, this is quite different from other time track games we played in the past. So be aware of that. Uh, we will note that I played wrong the first time thinking it was just like the others. Now, actions you can take on your turn include traveling and arriving at a brewery, tasting a beer, buying beer and or cheese, and camping for the night. There are three ways to travel. Riding a bike is the safest and most reliable. It generally takes longer than the other two methods, but guarantees you don't waste more time than you were planning on. Mm -hmm. Also, once you've had enough to drink, you can't ride that bike anymore. 
Before that point though, taking a long ride can sober you up. You drop one point on the alcohol track for every four time units in a row that you bike. Your next option is to take the bus. The problem with this is that there's a one in six chance the bus will run late and the trip will cost you two extra time units. Now on a positive note, in Belgium you can drink on the bus. So for every time unit you spend on a bus, including possibly that extra waiting time, you can drink a beer from your backpack, which increases your beer's tasted track and your alcohol track. Uh, the final most risky but potentially quickest option is to hitchhike. Here, you roll the dice and have a 50% chance to be picked up. If you aren't picked up, you lose two time units. You can then try again and roll an additional die, with failure costing you another two time units. If you still haven't been picked up, you can continue to try with three dice, with each failure costing you two more time units. Now, when hitchhiking, you can avoid this randomness by offering your ride beer. If you pay two beers per time unit required, you get to travel without rolling the dice. Note, we forgot this rule the first play, and it makes a big difference. Oh, yeah. Now, once you've figured out your method of travel and spent your appropriate time units, you arrive at a beer brewery. If there's a beer bottle there, you get to take it. That represents a collectible you've picked up, some glassware or an actual beer bottle. If not, and there's a coaster there, you get to take that. Now, if the brewery you arrived at is one of the special breweries, you get to raise your trackers on your player board accordingly. Now, there are a number of these special breweries on the map. These include the world-famous Trappist Breweries, the designer's favorite breweries, fan-favorite breweries, which were voted on during the Kickstarter, and a brewery at each of the th four compass points. If another player is at a brewery you just, that you just arrived at, and you both have beer in your backpacks, you must toast each other. You give each other a beer cube and raise the following tracks, your alcohol level, beers tasted track, and toast track, and each spend one time unit. Now, different breweries are out different actions, each of which cost one time unit. Most will let you taste beers. Others will let you buy beers and cheese, and there's even a couple where all you can do is visit them. Tasting beers ups your tasted beer track and your alcohol track. Buying beers gives you three beer cubes to put in your backpack, and buying cheese has you put your cheese counter up by one. Now, cheese is worth points at the end of the game, but you can also eat it at any time. Every time you eat cheese, you decrease your cheese track by one and increase your sobriety by one. Now, watching your sobriety is a key part of this game. Once you drink, drink enough beers, you won't be able to bike anywhere anymore. A couple of beers after that, taking the bus takes twice as long and the penalty for failed hitchhiking doubles. Drink a couple more beers, and you will pass out, losing out on the rest of your actions for that day. Now, the last action you can take is to camp for the night. You lay your black packer meeple on its side and can then spend time units drinking beers you've saved up in your backpack on a one-to-one -one basis. Now, on your turn, you can also collect objectives. The four objectives located on the right, full bottle side of the track, are up for grabs. These include goals like buying or tasting beer at specific breweries, having specific types of beer in your backpack, having a set number of beer bottles or coasters, um, and other things. Claimed objectives are paced, uh, placed on your player board face down. Mm -hmm. At the end of your turn, replenish any chosen objectives by sliding them to the right and filling open spots from the deck. Now on the time track, there are three bottle tokens. The first player to pass one of these can break the bottle and remove an available objective from play. Now if they choose not to, the next person that passes gets the same option until the bottle's broken or everyone has passed. Once all players have reached the end of the time track or are camping, the day ends. At the end of day one, the remaining level one objectives are shuffled in with the level two objectives and the new deck is placed on the board. Players then score points. So on a night phase, points are awarded for beers tasted and beer bottles and coasters collected. No, that means on day one, day two and day three, you're going to score them multiple times. So it's something you want to get up and early and get lots of at the beginning of the game because they just kind of accumulate as the game goes on. Then the time track is reset, the order of the player tokens is flipped and put back to the start. Then players who drank too much will take a slep in penalty based on how drunk they were the night before. Then everyone's alcohol level drops by four. Note not to the bottom of the track. 
The game then continues for day two, which plays identically to day one, except for the fact that the players now have more time and there are now level two objectives that will come up in the mix. At the end of day two, players again get points for their beers tasted and beer bottles and coasters collected. Day three is another short day. No new objectives are added, and by the end of this day, players want to be at the Grand Palace in Brussels. Now, once everyone's reached the end of the time track on the third day, you calculate everyone's final score. Here, you're going to get points for the standard things of tasted beers, bottles, and coasters, but you're also going to score your bonus brewery tracks, one point for every beer in your backpack, the amount of cheese you've saved up, the total number of different breweries you visited, the cheese, uh, the objective cards you've collected during the game, and if you qualify for any of the level three objectives. What's interesting here is some of these actually award negative points. For example, if you never partake in a toast, your score on the toast track will be showing negative five points. Similarly, you lose two points if you never visit a Trappist brewery. If you did not make it to the Grand Palace before reaching the end of the time track, you are penalized 15 points per travel action required to get there. That's big. The player with the most points wins, with a tie being broken by the player who got to the Grand Palace first. Now, in addition to these core rules, the game also includes a shorter version. There are no level 3 objectives. Level 2 objectives are only used if the level 1 deck runs out. Players get to pick where they start off at the beginning of the game, and you only play two 24-hour time slots with one mid-game scoring opportunity. So let's move on to some of our thoughts on the Belgian beers race. So when I first heard this game existed, I was like, there is a game for me. I need to get a copy of this. As Sean noted at the top of this review, it's like this game was made for me. My two biggest hobbies are board gaming and craft beer. I was sold on this game before ever sitting down to play it. Honestly, it could have been terrible. It could have been one of the worst games I've ever played, and I still would have appreciated owning it. I, I, and appreciate the fact this exists. I wanted it on my shelf so that I have a Belgian beer drinking board game. Luckily, though, the game is not at all terrible, and it is actually quite good. It is a rather thematic game that has a great flow once you get the rules down. On the other side, I am not a drinker. While I can and do from time to time enjoy a beverage, you'll never find me raiding or collecting beers. I couldn't tell you if I like an IPA more than a Pilsner. That said, the game still worked for me. The feel of travel in a foreign land and a level of tension in the time mechanic, along with collecting and a bit of competition with friends, just felt good. Now, what I like most about the Belgian beers race is the way the theme is integrated with the mechanics, the way they're tied together. Because what you do in this game feels like what you'd be doing if you really were backpacking across Belgium. This integration makes onboarding and teaching new players relatively easy and remembering the rules also just sticks there's retention there even if weeks go in between games just because the concepts in the game just make sense while some of the concepts may seem a little obscure to north americans uh hitchhiking and drinking on the bus are real aspects of traveling in belgium and even the scoring in this game makes sense right you want to hit as many different breweries as you can but you also want to make sure to visit some specific noteworthy ones you want to watch for promotions and collect bottles and coasters before they run out because there's only so many at each brewery. You're in Belgium, and if you don't hit at least one Trappist brewery and you don't meet up with friends at least once for a toast, you're doing it wrong. Now, while I personally, especially nowadays, would treat a, tr a trip to Belgium very differently, as I'd probably want to go check out Deschore and try to get backstage at Tomorrowland, I can also see 20 years ago <laughs> doing some beer tours. Now, the objectives add to this by having you want to try different beers or take different actions at the breweries you visit, which also makes the game more replayable because they're going to change up every game, both the order they come up and which ones are going to come up during the game. The random coaster distribution also helps with this, as in one game, one brewery might have enough coasters for everyone, where in another one, there may not be enough and everyone's racing to get there before they're out, and one of the breweries that was important last game may not matter at all this time. This means that even if you're not into the theme deeply, you can still appreciate the game behind it and know that each play will be different enough that you can't walk in with a preset plan to win. Now, mechanically, the, the shining highlight of this game is the time track system. For one, it's also thematic, each time unit being half an hour. Dropping for beer and loading up your pack, half an hour. Doing a tasting, half an hour. Miss the bus, ooh, you just lost an hour, and so on. 
Second, I like the way the active player continues to keep playing until they're in first. This is quite a change from other games. Now, while I agree, I love the track. The half hour aspect was a bit tricky. When you see one time unit, most people default by nature to one hour or one minute. And actually referring it to it as a half an hour became a little problematic. Uh, ignoring how long it represents and just calling it one time or one time unit uh, worked better for me and avoided the confusion when people inevitably call it one hour when they actually mean one half hour or one unit. Which is fair. Now, as for this time track, you've got to realize how different this is. So other games, for example, that use time tracks that I really enjoy are Takedo or, say, Glenn Moore. When those games, once you pass anyone, it's now their turn to go because they're in last. Whereas in this game, you end up doing a lot more on your turn. Which I've got to say feels more rewarding. It feels like you're accomplishing more on your turn. Though really, if you just went around the table, you'd still do the same things. It just wouldn't feel as much. It also feels kind of thematic too, especially if you get one of the long routes. If you take a long bus ride, you're going to end up way further on the time track and basically have to sit back and wait while everyone else catches up, which just kind of gives that thematic note of I'm on the bus for a long damn time. The one detriment to this is, as with many Euro games, there isn't a lot of player interaction, so it can be tempting, especially if you've just opened up a wide lead on the time track after your turn to pick up your phone or otherwise get distracted while everyone else plays catch up, only needing to react if someone happens to land on the spot you're in. Yeah, most of the player interaction here is about grabbing things before other players, which doesn't really fit integrate with the time track system at all. So again, I say it's pretty thematic to want to pull out your phone while you're wasting time on a bus ride. <laughs> now, while some player, what some players may not like about this game, because um, it's it's a pretty pure Euro otherwise, is the randomness involved in the travel system. While it is possible to play this game biking everywhere, never having to roll a set of dice, perhaps even just saving up beers for you always pay for hitchhiking, I don't think you could do this and end up with a winnable score. I'll admit we haven't tried it, but I don't think it's possible. You just won't hit enough different locations for this to pan out. So at some point, you're going to have to roll the bones, and the winner in this game can be determined based on good or bad die rolls. Now, thankfully, the game does present ways to avoid the dice. Like I said, again, specifically the beer bribe rule, as we call it. Do not miss the fact that you can pay in beer to avoid rolling with hitchhiking. We missed this rule the first couple plays, and it made for a longer, more frustrating game. So take advantage of that rule when you can. Because the dice, sooner or later, will turn on you. I speak from experience. This can, unfortunately, if you haven't allowed for it, make for a major swing in the final score, even if your rolls only turn bad at that last roll of the game. Yep. Yeah, there is definitely a push-your-luck aspect to getting to Belgium, or there can be. You can play it safe, but then it's always that chance to try to get one more beer in before you get to the end. Now, another aspect I do like about the Belgian beers race is the fact it's a point salad. There are lots of different ways to score points, and so far I've yet to see a specific winning strategy that's better than others, except for the fact I have noticed that if you don't try a lot of beers, if you don't taste a lot of beers, you tend to not be able to win, but come on, thematically, that's got to be one of your goals in the Belgian beer race to taste beers. As for the other stuff, you're going to get points for drinking beer, you're going to get points for collecting bottles and coasters, for toasting, for hoarding cheese, for visiting specific breweries, for the number of breweries you can get to, and all those random objectives. Like in one game, I saw one player make it a personal goal to hit all the special breweries. In another, I saw a pl tr player try to leave Brussels with a full backpack of beers. 24 beers, it's got to be a heavy backpack. And in a third game, I saw a player try to stay as sober as possible throughout the game. All of these personal play styles seem to work and seem to be encouraged by the game. Now, and as a point salad, with some point games from achievements hidden during the play, trying to work out if you have the lead or not is nigh impossible. Mm -hmm. Do they have 10, 20, 15 uh, cards, 15 points, or 35 points in achievements? Unless you're counting every card as someone achieves them, you really have to play your best game and just hope it was better than the others. Yeah, there is, a, there is a full discussion we could have on open scoring and closed scoring, and personally, I like this type. So you don't always know who the leader is. That's a lot of positives. So on the negative side of things, I do want to point out a few things, and, and the biggest one is the graphic design. This leaves um, quite a bit to be desired. 
I totally get it. They got a famous Belgian beer label maker to do the artwork. And yes, that does give a certain aesthetic to the game, but I've found that that design can hinder gameplay. The biggest problem is the board itself. It is just busy. It is a very busy board. It is overwhelming and it scares people away. If I threw this game out at a public play event with casual gamers, they are going to not gravitate to this game, uh, especially because the Belgian label style isn't really something we see here. So it's not like someone's going to be in the corner going, oh, those look like beer labels. It's just going to look busy and overwhelming. Another another issue is that busy style doesn't con- isn't conducive to the lighting in many yes. locations. That's true, too. Like, you got to think about it. Every route between every brewery has three different icons on it for the three transportation modes. And each brewery is presented as this, like, poker chip looking circle that's trying to fit way too much information in that small circle. Because you've got the brewery number kind of enlarged in the middle, but that gets covered up almost instantly. Then you've got two smaller brewery numbers, one facing each end of the board. Then you've got the type of brewery based on the color, which also sometimes gets covered up. Um, Then if you can or can't buy beer there, if you can or can't taste beer there, and then any special brewery symbols like the Trappists are octagons and the hearts are fan favorites. It can actually be hard to see across the table. And every game I played with every playing group has had someone have to ask, hey, can I drink beer there or can I do that? Or is that number 13 or 18? Yeah, in good lighting with young, healthy eyes, this probably isn't that big of a deal. But both lighting and healthy eyes can be in short supply these days. <laughs> so, assuming your intricate and beautiful, highly detailed design will be readable, was a bit of a stretch on this one. Now, another annoyance uh, for me came in the form of the visited brewery tokens. These are super tiny. These are some of the smallest tokens we've ever seen um, since Disney Sidekicks. Not only am I worried about losing them, because you need to have all of these to play the game, There's no real good place to put them on the board. As noted, the brewery information is already hard enough to see without everyone trying to toss tokens by and on top of it. And the fear of losing these is actually what keeps me from bringing this game out to public play events. Yeah, if it weren't for these tokens, which are an important aspect of the game, you can't just leave them off. It would be a fantastic game to bring out to events, but because of them, it's unworkable as a game to bring out, especially in a slightly dark venue if one goes flying. Now, my final complaint about the Belgian beers race is the player board. These are very thin and slippery, and you track a lot of things on them. You've got a toast track. You've got a cheese track. You've got a taste of beers track. You've got five tracks for special breweries. You've got all your beer cubes in your backpack. You've got your sobriety level. If this board gets bumped or your table gets bumped, that's potentially a lot of tracked important information that can be lost. And I noticed that with the lack of dual layer player boards to keep the tokens in place, it would have actually been more effective to use flat cardboard tokens and a Mm -hmm. slightly less glossy player board to keep things from getting disturbed. Wouldn't have obviously helped with the theming, but it certainly would have made it less likely to send things flying. Yeah, I agree. So overall, I really dig this game, but I I have to admit, I was predisposed to like this. So this this falls at the intersection of two of my biggest hobbies, right? Like it, it's, it's a perfect hit here. The real question here, though, for anyone listening or reading is um, if non-beer fans would enjoy this game. And I've got to say, based on the players I played with, which is two different groups, I'd say yes, definitely. Well, the majority of people I play with played the Belgian beers race with are beer fans. None of them are really into beers and brewing and tastings and rating beers as much as I am. And only one other person that I played with even knows what a Trappist beer is. So, of course, I did have to educate the other players while we were playing how important those red beers were. More importantly, though, I've also played the game with a couple of non-drinkers, including Sean, and they also enjoyed the game. To them, this was a solid travel game, as much about backpacking and getting around as it is about actually the beers. Everyone I played this with has loved the time track system and the player interaction involved. Whether this played out through grabbing a beer bottle to glassware or glassware before another player, getting that last um, coaster before someone else got there, being the first to get to all the Trappists, or grabbing an objective before someone else claimed it, or using that bottle to smash someone just before getting it, and the ever-popular toasting someone when they had better plans. 
In many ways, this game can be quite familiar to many non-drinkers. It's not unlike going out and hanging out with your beer connoisseur friends and enjoying <laughs> dabbling in a bit of what they love while finding your own take on the activities to enjoy. Uh, that there's a lot of other uh, those other activities to enjoy in this game, uh, even if it is primarily about the alcohol. Now, another aspect people have a lot of fun with, and that is the tension on that third day and even trying to squeeze things in on the second day. But just that trying to make your flight at the end of the game, the final part of the Belgians beer race, while everyone is trying to get back to the Grand Palace before running out of time has always been tense. There's always a player who, who plays it safe, who gets there way ahead of time and maybe hits a couple last breweries in Brussels and it's like, I'm good, I'm good. And they basically end their game while everyone else is tension. But there's always one or two players who trying to squeeze in one last tasting, one last shopping trip, one more beer on the bus before I have to get on the plane. And that's always enjoyable. And as someone who got burned, not by cutting it close, but by the dice, I may be a bit less in favor of this game's ending. But the dice are part of the game throughout and simply something that needs to be allowed for. And you never have to rely on the dice. You can push your luck. Now, one of the best interactions I've actually had in this game ever was meeting up with another player just outside Brussels and forcing them to do a toast, which meant they missed their bus and thus the final flight, while I, more sober, still had plenty of time to bike to the palace. While there is little player interaction in this game, there is enough where that one act of sharing a drink with friends can ruin well-laid plans. If you're a beer fan who knows why Belgian beers are considered some of the best beers in the world, and you know how rare a true Trappist beer is and how rare they're becoming, and you play board games, which I assume you must or you wouldn't be listening right now, you should pick up a copy of the Belgian Beers Race. You're going to love it for the theme alone, and you'll get a kick out of the beer guide that comes inside. Even if you can't convince your friends to play it that often, it's just a cool game to own and have on your shelf. Look, I have a game about Belgian beers. Isn't that cool? The thing is, though, this is actually a good game. One of the best time track games I've played. So if the theme of travel and hiking around Belgium sounds fun to you, whether you actually care about Belgian beer or not, there's a lot to like in this game. Yeah, well, because of the theme, it's not a game I'm likely to ask to play all that often. It is certainly a fun game that I wouldn't ever turn down playing mm -hmm. if offered. Uh, it really did have enough solid Euro game in there, even for the non-drinkers. Now, one thing I do want to point out, this is not a super simple game. It's a game about beer. This is not a drinking game or a party game. This is a medium weight Euro with all the complexity that goes with that. So this is not a game to pick up for your drinking buddies or your aunt who likes to try new beers now and then, but isn't a board gamer. While casual drinking may be encouraged by the game, this is not a casual game. And to be clear, we do not in any way support or recommend casual drinking. Please consult your local laws for drinking ages, learn your limit, consume within it. Now, you're also going to want to avoid this if you don't want or allow alcohol references at your table for whatever reason. You don't want to knock someone off the wagon because you played a beer-themed board game with them. And getting pass out drunk is probably not a good gaming topic for playing with little kids. Though at the same time, getting pass out drunk is not shown as being a good thing in this game. As you become more inebriated, you're able to function less, and eventually you lose the rest of your day. Not an invaluable lesson on drinking. Personally, my only regret about this game is that I missed out on the Kickstarter and didn't get the Deluxe Edition. I would have loved the dual layer player boards, the three mini expansions, the actual bottle caps for 50 point uh, scoring and other upgrades. That said, you wouldn't have gotten anything better for tracking what breweries you'd been to, so the component flaws that we discussed weren't addressed by the Kickstarter version. Though they kind of were in a way because the Deluxe Edition does give you player aids, which I still find gets wrong that a player aid should be a stretch goal. Give us player aids. Well, these player aids list every brewery, what you can do at every brewery with a checkbox next to them. Well, you probably don't want to write on your player aids, you could make copies of these. And I wonder if this might be a better way to track where everyone's been. With how much my regular game group and I are enjoying the game, what I would love to see actually with this is other beer race games from the same publisher. Like I would love to play through the German beers race, starting and ending in Munich and including the five Seda Clive. 
Or maybe even expand the theme a little bit and do the Spanish wine race, including the Santiago de Compostela pilgrimage. Um, yeah, I don't know. That might be a bit much for me. <laughs> uh, hey, maybe if I can take in the running of the bulls while you're drinking beers, I think we might. There you go. Game. Well, that's it for our review of the Belgian beers race. Remember, if you do drink while playing this game or otherwise, drink responsibly. Thank you for joining us. Before you go, it'd be awesome if you would retweet, share, like, subscribe, follow, thumbs up, whatever it is you do to say thanks to content creators for the content you just consumed. And also, when you have time, check out my written review of the Belgian's beer, Belgian beers race at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. How many times did Sean or I say Belgians instead of Belgian? Wow. I was trying. I was trying to put the S in the right place every time. I was trying. I know, at least I know once you I know it. I caught you say Belgians. I know you got it at least twice. Yeah. And it's supposed to be beers. Belgian beers. Not Belgians beer. Yeah. It's, so a, it's a weird title. A title. It's, it's, a, it's a weird specific title. Yes, it is. So uh, Friday night played belgian beers race in prep for this review which i mainly wanted to do so sean could try it and i gotta say i think it was a bit of a surprise how much you actually enjoyed it yeah i was prepared to smile and nod through this game completely uh put up with beer lovers because well you know as a non-drinker I, I think many non-drinkers can sort of uh understand how that goes sometimes <laughs> uh but i didn't this was a solid fun game even if the dice were utterly evil to me you and Cat, Cat, I don't understand why she even tries to hitchhike in that game. Like I can start taking a bike everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I, I made my, I started my run back to the palace with tons of time left. Yeah, but like four different sections, the dice killed me. Um, I had no plans on cutting it short, and I ended up going from second to last. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it hurts. I, th that was the first time someone hadn't made it to any of our games. We've had people pass out on the bus on the way there, and we always laughed about, you know, their friends just dragging them on the plane. But yeah, that was the first time we saw someone fail. So that actually, uh, that, that night ended early. Tori and Kat had a bunch going on last weekend, so called it an earlier night. So then we th slipped in, after the Belgian beers race, a three-player game of Dice Kingdoms of Valeria at the end of the night. And this was our first time using the Winter Expansion. And I think the big thing there was, I think we all just kind of felt it would feel the same as the other game with a slightly different map. And we were shocked by how different the game felt. Like it, it I don't know, it invoked different emotions. It, it just felt like you had to strategize different. I was just shocked by how different two sheets of paper made. Yeah. And, and there were like certain parts of it weren't there. Like the, the gold track wasn't different at all. Uh, but nope. the, then the, uh, the, the terrain track, the traveling track, that was vastly different yeah. uh, and into it incorporated the monster attack tracks, which were previously all accessible and now needed to be unlocked. Um, unfortunately, the graphic design indicating that mm -hmm. was not ideal. Yeah, this one, I, I, the, uh, it feels like there was a printing error. Like, like they didn't get the proofs, like uh, the, the contrast is too high. Or something that the dark are too low. I don't know which it is. The, the darks were too dark. There, there is definitely an issue with that. Something we'll cover in our review. But I was just shocked. Like, yes, I knew that you were going to have to unlock different monsters. But even just the changes for what each building unlocked when just really changed the feel of the game. And I found I really wasn't using as many citizens as I always did in the previous game. Which I think was an interesting thing. I've, I've, though I got less. So I don't know. Like it. it Felt like I needed less citizens, but then I didn't get to do as much on the other players' turns. Yeah, and while I went heavy on citizens, uh, as I have have not in the past, which has hurt me in the previous <laughs> iteration, uh, it didn't help me as much no. as it might have uh, if we were playing the 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 fall or uh, you know spring or whatever summer version of the game. Yeah. Uh, next up was our first play of the My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria deck building game. What is with deck building games and huge titles? Clank, the deck building adventure, DC hero, DC comics, the deck. What is with these huge names? IP is like, going to IP. Me. You know, you got to get that. Whole Clank's title. not an IP, though. Like just all, all these deck buildings have huge, huge time names. 
Well, I mean, it, even if you even if you don't add in deck building game, just My Little Pony's Adventure in Equestria yes. on its own is a, is a meaty title. Um, yeah. At least they didn't throw in their throwing Friendship is Magic as well. You know, the My Little Pony Friendship is Magic That's Adventures true. in Equestria deck building game is something they could have named that game. <laughs> I, I I haven't looked it up, but I don't, I don't want to see the expansion names because I bet you it's something like that. <laughs> oh God, yeah. So anyway, uh, neat game. I, I was surprised by this one. There, there, was a, there was a lot going on. Um, I have to thank Donna from our Discord. Um, oh, I feel bad. I'm forgetting her podcast name right now. Her and Will's podcast. If we can think of it, we'll throw it in in the show notes. Um, Donna, fan of the show, is the one who said, hey, if you like deck builders, pick this up. This is not a, you know, a little kid's game at all. And no, it's not, which is the, the biggest worry. It's just like we've said about many Disney games. I do worry people are going to see My Little Pony's Adventures in Equestria deck building game and think, hey, a deck builder for my eight year old. That's not what this is. Yeah, I, I was joking around a lot the night before about, you know, we have to you know, have a drink every time someone says friendship or magic and and all this. Well, if you'd been drinking in this game, you would have failed miserably. Oh, yeah, because there is a lot to manage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot going on in this game. Like there are tons of the six resources. Did we figure out it was there? There's there, six, there's resources, six core resources plus a time tracking resource. Yeah, um, uh, out there. And that's... honestly, if you if you played Marvel Champions, Marvel Champions is easier to track what's going on than this is. This is getting up there with Sentinels of the Multiverse and the amount of different things you're keeping track of. So as a deck builder, you've got three core resources that you use to do things. But then there's three other physical resources you collect in the form of different sugar cubes that you have to spend to also do things, though different kinds of things. Like it was just I, I, a lot. Yeah, <laughs> really yeah, it, a lot. Re it really was. And I don't think it's overwhelming. No. It's just more than we certainly expected yeah. for something of this IP. So it's a, it's a, it seems like a neat game. It's cooperative, which is unique to deck builders. There aren't a lot of cooperative deck builders out there. It's you versus the game. And this is a pure deck builder. Like there's a market. You all start with the same 10 cards minus one. Thank you. Asymmetry. Every character has their own unique ability. Thank you for the asymmetric card in there. Um, where you are buying cards. So this isn't, you know, a, a, you can't compare it to Marvel Champions, which is a deck construction game. This is a deck builder. Um, I have played a few cooperative ones. They're, they're out there, but they're not that common. Where you have Ponyville and you have different parts of Ponyville and you, you move around the town and you're supposedly like solving minor problems and doing things around town. Basically, now that I played it once, I can describe it this way, collecting sugar cubes to help you overcome obstacles. Because that was something I didn't get out of the rule book. The real goal here is go around the town, improve your deck to collect Huber cubes to overcome obstacles. And then, and then you once you have your stuff, you try to overcome the obstacles. Then there's an element of chaos where you flip up a card and you have to spend something extra that hopefully you've saved up for. If you get through three obstacles, you get to then try to do the final thing. I don't want to say final fight because this is my little pony. And like the final thing in this case was, I, I was in someone being vain at a fashion show or something we were trying to <laughs> stop. Because it is My Little Pony. Uh, neat game. Um, some issues, though. Yeah. Uh, again, on, on the good side, though, you know, there is uh, there is tension. There is a mm -hmm. timing system that gives you tension. And very nice. They built a timing mech or a, a, a self-wiping mechanism into the market. Yes. So you don't get your market jammed up. But on top of that, they added cards that made use of that me mechanic into the game so that the game wipes uh if nothing has been bought or not wipes but but clears one new card out every time yeah. every turn when nothing has been wiped but if something happens certain cards fall off the end there is a there is something that happens like there is a trigger on that as well yep. so that was a really nice uh and interesting thing to see happen so the biggest problem though is the cards the text is so tiny these are this is there's card text on uh, specifically the city cards or I, I, I'm probably using the wrong terminology Ponyville. from the game. The Ponyville cards, like the, the central card where the card text is small enough. I would have a hard time reading it in my hand, specifically the icons for how much of those three resources you have to spend. The horseshoe, which is represents um, help. I think it is the help icon is terrible across the board. It looks like a fighter's shield. And when you pick it up, it looks like a fighter shield that probably has a small number in it, which could be a six or could be an eight. And it's kind of hard to tell because it's so tiny. Um, these were unreadable at arm length for me. 
And there is no way my wife, who has more vision problems than me, could even play this game. Yeah, even with a magnifying glass, uh, you know, given it without context, you wasn't you weren't able to figure it out. Uh, and then yeah. on top of that, the placement of certain uh, they did one thing nice. So uh, each of the uh, resources on the cards is in a specific location on every yep. card. So if you're getting help, if you're getting horseshoes, it's always in that same place in the card. If you're getting speed, it's always in the same place. But the place they chose to put it with the art behind it on one of the cards made it disappear into the background. And yeah. that was frustrating. Yeah. All right, enough about that one. We've only played once. We will, we will continue to complain about the graphic design on that one <laughs> that I'm sure will feature in our review. Gameplay wise, though, seems solid. It, it was definitely, as as um, Sarah said, not a, a easy, simple kids game. That's for sure. Now, that said, I did play it with my youngest daughter um, who does. We've mentioned before, have some some disabilities that make it hard for her to handle some games. And she was able to pick it up. So that was a good sign. I was worried she'd be overwhelmed, but she even claimed the cards were unreadable. And it was bad for her because she had some esteem issues and didn't want to ask us to read out the cards for her. So instead just wasn't taking actions. Now to help with that, this game is cooperative and does encourage open hand play. So the game actually worked better with her once we were more helping her with, Hey, you have this, you could do this. Yeah, it, it was, it was, it is nice in that uh, you, it, it is open enough uh, that you just, everyone throws their cards down there. Everyone can help. Uh, if there are players who are struggling to yep. work out strategy and such. Next, we have another first play. First time hitting the table off the pile of shame. And that is Downforce. Uh, the interesting thing here, and I feel some some uh, board game geek uh, uh, credit going away on me, is this is actually my first Restoration Games game. And I've got to say, just based on this one, the rep is deserved. This it looks great. It feels great. The box sensors great. The components are nice. The rule book was very clear. And the game was really good. Now, I found this dirt cheap, but at this point, I would not have felt bad if I had played full price. Yeah, I was I have to say I was shocked. Um, this was a solid game for something that I remember as being one of those, you know, throwaway games on the shelf at at Sears or whatever, you know, you saw it in, you saw it in the, in the Sears Christmas wish book. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you knew that it probably really wasn't that great a game. Uh, but restoration has done well by it. And this is a hobby game. <laughs> yeah. Really neat game. Um, I will say the the first game was a little rough and I will say reading the rules. I was scared of this one a bit because it starts with an auction. And I think of this quick, like it's restoration. It's an old 1974 game that's been updated, modern sensibilities. I'm like, really? You're going to start with an auction. But now that I played it, it works really well. And and I know Sean doesn't even like auction games in general at all. Will avoid auction games. And I think this one did it right. Yeah, no, it really did. I think uh, and it part of it is it forces you into a new way of thinking uh so the auction the, the results of the auction don't matter at the end of the auction they matter yeah. at the end of the game and so that separation of the mechanic uh really kind of made it more interesting to me and i and i wasn't expecting that yeah and then just mechanically it's a good game now i will admit it's not a racing game you are not playing a car and trying to come in first this is actually a betting and auction game but man it is done really well it's a, it's a pretty simple, what happens at the beginning is you are auctioning off the, the cars, who owns each of the cars. So just like in other horse racing games, who owns the horses, then you're going to use your hand of cards to move the cars. And the whole thing is the card will show multiple cars and you move every car on your card around the board. The board's really generalized, simple racetrack with some tight spots. And of course, your strategy is try to make the cars you own win. But then very shortly into the game, you get to place your first bet. So even if your cars aren't necessarily doing well, you bet on who you think is going to win play show. And yes, I know these are horse racing terms. First, second, third. Do you call them that for, for, for betting on races? I don't even know. For horse racing, it's called win play show. Obviously, I know more about horse racing than car racing. Um, but then now you're rooting for other cars, right? Like, so even if your two cars you bought aren't doing well, you want to make sure the cars you bet on did well. And then two other points in the game, you get to place more bets. Of course, that first bet pays out better than the third bet, but you can constantly still be in the race. Then it gets to the trick at the end where you have to pay for the auction at the beginning of the game. 
So you're trying to make sure your bets and your cars win to offset your initial investment. And like, this is just like a game I'm sure six year olds could probably play, but you've got that whole investment betting thing going on. Like, I, I find it fascinating what they've managed to put in this to keep it super accessible, but still making the heavy gamer in me happy. Yeah. It, it, again, working out your, your, your sort of idea of, of how much you're going to go in for and how many cars you're willing to try and buy and how much you're willing to pay for them, knowing that at the end there will come a reckoning yeah. if your cars have all lost and your bets have failed, you know, you're, you're in the doghouse. That's yeah, fascinating. We've only played this one twice. I have no idea if we'll ever do a full review. This might be the only time we talk about this. This is something we bought. Now, heads up, people in Windsor, Ontario, if you come out April 15 to the Barbershop Bar, what I'm going to do is crack open a copy of this game. I'm going to set it up on a table, and I'm going to teach you to play. You'll learn how to play Downforce. Then when you play Downforce, I'm going to note down your name. At the end of the night, I'm going to draw one of those names, and if you can show me that you subscribe to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast on whatever, wherever, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you can do it. If you can show me that, I'm going to let you take that copy of the game home. And trust me, now that I played it, this is an awesome prize. This is a really solid game. Absolutely. Uh, next up was more Dice Kingdoms with the Winter Expansion. Um, at this point, the goal is to review this one in two weeks. So want to get in a couple more plays. I think we've seen a lot to what that game's to offer. So I don't think there's much more to say about that one. Yep. And then the last thing is on Sunday, we played La Familia or La Familia. I've been told the G might be silent. So I think it's La Familia. Uh, this was over at Brenda's. This is from Puzzling Pursuits and extremely similar to Black Brim. This is started off chapter one is five individual separate puzzles, which I like because then each of us was able to take a part of it and start working on it. Though this time, no one solved their part on their own. Um, this required interaction and other sets of eyes and sharing things. I would say the difficulty on La Familia is probably double the difficulty in Black Brim. Whereas in Black Brim, I was handed a puzzle. I looked at it and went, oh, I'm just going to have to do this. And then I do that thing and go, yep, there's the answer. Well, we did have those. But the thing is, when you did that, you were like, oh, that led me to step one. Now I need to figure out what to do with that. And then what to do with that. Everything had multiple steps to it. So like not only did you solve the maze, you then had to use the answer for the maze to tell you the hint to go check the other thing. And when you check the other thing, you realized all it gave you was a number. Oh, now you have to go back to the maze to figure out what that number represents. Like there was just some really interesting twists and turns to this puzzle. Interesting. Another example of how difficult it was is, yes, we had to use hints. There was one particular puzzle we got stuck on. And I don't think we would have ever got it. Now, what I did appreciate, this does use a website. You have to go to puzzlingpursuits.com. And one of the things they tell you to do is after you've got the answer for anything, put it in and you might get some storyline along with whether you're right or wrong. And there were ones we put in multiple times wrong until we figured out the right one. But there was a point where we did need a hint. And what I liked is it was presented in like, I think this particular puzzle had 11 hints. So I could very easily go, yeah, yeah, we did that. Yeah, yeah, we did that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yep. We got that. Yeah. Got that. And then all of a sudden, oh, I didn't think of that. And I could stop with just that one hint that went, this one part of the newspaper is referencing this. That's all it talked about. That's all the hint was. It didn't give me the solution. It just said, hey, this part is talking about this other part of the newspaper. Then I went back to that part and went, oh, okay, I get it. And was able to solve that particular puzzle while working with other players. Interesting. Yeah. Unfortunately, the, uh, not enough people have played La Familia to uh, to give it a, a weight yet. Um, yeah, it's the kind of game where most people don't even realize is on Board Game Geek. I think that's the thing is they, the people buying this possibly aren't even on Board Game Geek or they don't think of it as a board game. Because really, it's not. It's a tabletop game. That's fair. Uh, I mean, Black Brim does have, or Black Brim is a 2.5. Um, okay. It, it does have uh, enough So this this may be, I will have to go on and give it a 2.6. I don't know. The problem is <laughs> I'd have to rate it 3 and I don't think it's quite a 3. Right. It's not heavy. It just was harder. The difficulty Fair. is harder. Fair now, enough. the interesting thing here is after we played through the first part, there's still one or more half. We kind of sat back and we're talking about it. I'm like, what do you think of this compared to the other one? And I was a little surprised because pretty much the whole family thought this was better. And the reason the the consensus was this felt plausible. This felt like you were involved. So as I described in our Blackburn review, and I think I even brought up the Batman term of it felt like the Riddler. 
It was a puzzle maker captured a bunch of cops and put them in their house. And you had to solve puzzles to save the cops. That just was random, right? Like the puzzles didn't really matter. There was one about classic art. There's one about architecture. There's one about this. Whereas this was the mafia boss has been handing out odd things to capos and they've increased in frequency. And then suddenly all the capos got the same thing. An undercover cop has gotten a copy of each of those, one of each. And here they are. Please help us solve it. And it felt like you were trying to help the, the police with these. And they look like things that mafia people may be using to obfuscate what they're trying to tell each other. And I will say the final answer to part one was very thematic. Excellent. So the entire family felt like they were more involved and invested in this one, which I thought was fascinating. Well, that's a good sign. Uh, maybe they're, uh, they're catching their, uh, their rhythm and figuring these, these games out as they, yeah, because I think this was the second one they did, so. So uh, that's it for what we've been playing. Now let's look ahead at what we have coming up. All right, so uh, as long as everything goes as planned, we're actually, I'm, I'm like planning ahead more than we usually do. I, we've actually got the next couple of weeks of reviews planned out. So Sunday, the plan is to finish up La Familia. We'll do part two. And then we're going to review that one along with the space box from Escape Welt. Because I thought it'd be kind of interesting to do two reviews of puzzle games together. So I thought that would fit. I'm going to dig through our uh, question hat to see if there's anything on puzzle games in there. And see if we can kind of bring the episode all together like we did tonight. Though I can't guarantee that because I'm not sure if I have any puzzle questions. Speaking of which, if anyone's got a puzzle related question, <laughs> uh, who's here live or who happens to catch, you know, the Ask the Bellhop segment on YouTube. You can send me a puzzle related question before next Wednesday. We might incorporate it in the show. There you go. Think now, folks. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Now, after that, I want to do an episode on expansions because one of the things I wouldn't say we're falling down on time, but they're starting to pile up are expansions in our pile of obligation. For some reason, getting new games to the table seems easier than getting out old games and playing expansions with them and old being figurative. <laughs> so old might some be of these are brand new. Uh -huh. Yeah, some of them are brand new, but it's getting harder to get the expansions done. And often we play the game and we're like, "Air, hey, we've reviewed the game. We got to review the expansion later, but I don't want to do it the next week. So we hold off and we don't always get back to it. So we've got a few that I will say we're taking longer than I would have liked to to get to. So my goal is to hammer out some expansion plays and then follow it up with an expansion focused episode. That's due in two weeks. Now, our Ask the Bellhop for that episode is probably going to be what are some must have expansions, board game expansions where you never want to play the game without them. And then I'm hoping to get done at least three reviews, possibly more, depending on what expansions we can get played in the next 14 days. Yeah, there's a bunch of uh, a bunch of stuff and, and expansions tend not to be as long, seeing as how we don't have to explain yeah. the full game mechanics. We can get through them that much more quickly. Now, along with that, it did crack open some new games. I've read the rules for Katara, Ishtar and Pacific Rails Inc. Those are all yellow games. And I wouldn't mind getting at least one of those to the table as a break from the obligation pile. And what we really need to do is we need to get your game of Weather Machine played again. Yeah, while we, uh, while we have any idea how that deeply confusing game plays. <laughs> yes. Try and, try and lock any of the rules into our mind. Now, this show wouldn't be possible without our Patreon patrons, our VIP guests. So here's a quick shout out to five of them. Uh, first up, we have Donna. Thank you to Pax. Valentine Pache. Thank you. Brian Sheehan. Good to see you on the Discord the other day. Ron F. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Roger Malosh, who may or may not still be in the chat room. Haven't seen her in a while. Check out Roger's spider-themed game at Roger Dodger Games. That's R-O-G-E-R-D-O-G-E-R. -E -E that was the double bell. That means our shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the lobby doors. Well, the doors are closed, you can always find us at TabletopBellhop.com. All over the web is Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Be sure to fill out the feedback form at the front desk on your way out by leaving us a review on your podcatcher of choice. The more reviews we get, the more people who may discover our show for the first time. That's all for us tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us live. And be sure to stick around for the penthouse after show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you.
and game on.